Well, Billy is going to be in fifth grade this year. And for Billy, school starts this next Friday. And all the kids said... (laughs) All right, kids, so um, students... I'm going to need some help along the way here in our sermon, so a little bit of interaction. I'm the youth pastor, so I get a little bit of grace. But students, you got one of two votes, all right? And this goes all the way from preschool all the way through high school graduates. You guys got to help me out. Either number one option is, I'm ready for school, kind of, to start on Friday. That's your first option. Two, I just want summer to last forever. So who's going to stand and own this with me? I'm ready for school to start even a little bit. Let's stand up, students. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, you own that. All right, it's okay. We had at least three in the first service, so I think we matched that here today, and I appreciate seeing some high schoolers standing up too. We'll have a talk later, what's up with that? But number two, your second option was, I want summer to last a little bit longer, and all those students, let's stand up if that's you. I definitely saw some middle school and high school students not standing on either one, so we're going to have to talk about this. But anyway, back to Billy. That's good to know. He has his backpack purchased, all right? He's, his mom brought him school shopping. He's got some new shoes and maybe even that first school day outfit. By the way, um, old people in the room with me, did your parents buy you a first day outfit? No, that's right. What's, what's going on now these days? But anyway, all right, so you got the outfit. Your lunch account has a balance in there, so you're ready for school lunches. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, you know the bus time. It's going to pick you up at this location this time. You know the drop-off procedure, so you're good to, get, good to go there. But maybe for Billy, there's just one more question that he doesn't have answered yet. And Billy is a Christ follower, all right, so he's a Christian but I don't even know if he knows the, the question is on the table. And here's the big question for us this morning. How do I take my faith to school? How do I take my faith to school? And today we want students of all ages to be ready for this. And so I know here today we have some that are like homeschooling this year. And uh, certainly I think you'll be able to apply the things in your setting with your family, with sports or whatever else, other interactions you have with other students. Um, private education, I know we're there. You'll be going to school this week. And then well, we have another segment of people in the audience today that you're not going to school on Friday. Who's excited about that, adults? Who's ready? They're not going to school this week. Yes. All right. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> No more tests, please. And, uh, but for today, the challenge is really for the adults because uh, we're speaking to students primarily, but what can you gather from the words in the scripture today to apply to your context? And so um, if you remember about a year ago or so in February, we did a marriage series for like four or five weeks. We had the different pastors preaching. And one of the students, probably multiple, asked their parent in about halfway through, When are we going to be done with this marriage series? This is horrible. And so, students, you guys endured that series. We appreciate you doing that. But today, the adults, you guys get to endure a message to students and kind of try to apply it to your own lives. And so, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter 2, 9 through 15 today. And so, you can turn in your Bibles if you have it. Otherwise, we'll have some notes up here. And all throughout the message today, there's going to be a few points And I'm going to ask the students, whether you're from preschool all the way through high school, you're going to have to do some actions with me, all right? Do some actions to help you be reminded of these major points. Shake with me. Are you up for that, students? Yes. All right. Excellent. Let's include college students on that, too. Why not? All right. There you go. Verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Students, I want you to be reminded today that you don't go to school on Friday without status. You come into school this school year with status. And we're calling this Students of the Month. Students of the Month. Because God calls you his chosen people. And we know what it's like to be chosen. 
Any of you guys remember those recess or PE days where they had two team captains and they said, you guys choose sides. Some of you guys are like getting PTSD right now because you got, you got picked last every time, so just stay with me. But we know, and I kind of, it's not very fun, is it? Because some kid always ends up getting picked last. Or it's like, oh, we got numbers, so you're going to have to sit out now. And that's not fun. But that's not the chosen here. You are God's chosen people. You're on God's team. And that's where we go into the school year with that thought. And so we get this idea of being chosen, but what, what about the other descriptors that it gives there? I don't know that we're always super familiar with things like royalty. Because in the United States, we don't really have royalty. We have a president, a vice president, congressman, congresswoman, all those things. But the people in Jesus' time, they would have understand, understood royalty because they had kings, they had kingship. And one thing they would have known for certain is that is not earned, it's inherited. So they had a placement, a right placement, all right, by inheritance, not something you earn. And we are God's chosen people on the very fact that he chose us. We don't earn that. Also, he talks about priesthood. So what does that mean? It's an inherited privilege of having direct access to God. And so that's what we're called to, priesthood. There's a guy by the name of Scott McKnight. He said this. He said, to become a Christian is to be raised to the ultimate height and status because we suddenly become children of the God of the universe and we have direct access to him because we are his children. And that's good news. That's the status, students, that you go to school with this week, this school year. And one thing to point out about this scripture in 1 Peter is, it's a collective. We are God's chosen people, the church, the called out ones. And so we in our culture, we love the individual, don't we? We love individual accomplishments, achievements, accolades, all of those things. And then you go to your school, it says student of the month. Boom, there's my picture. No, I was never student of the month in my high school. But anyway, it's like individual, individual, individual. Well, here in scripture, it's we. We are the priesthood of believers. We are God's chosen people. And so we work at this together, the mission that God has for us. And certainly within a priesthood, there's individual priestly duties, right? So certainly you have to live out your faith on your own, all right? But we want to be reminded today that you do it in community, and I got to hear um, a testimony of a guy that comes to the first service, Kelly, got invited by some friends and showed up to church here. And he shared his testimony the other day. And he was just sharing about how shocked he was when he came to church for the first time. Number one, it was very welcoming, which is always a win. But number two, he was surprised at how many people he saw in church that he never knew went to church here. And he, he was just encouraged by that, this idea of I'm not alone as I go out into the world. I have people with me. And um, students, it's easy to forget that. If you're serious about your faith or you want to take a step in your faith um, this school year and you think, man, I have to go it alone in my class or on my sports team, uh, maybe you look around this morning, look around on Wednesday nights when we kick off Radiate and Awana. I think there's other students that are living out their faith as well. And you get to be encouraged by that. Verses 11 through 12 say this. Oh, I forgot the, I forgot the action forgot the action. So we are students of the month, students, plural, all right? So um, I need everyone, if you're preschool through college, just get get a nice crown right here, get those crowns ready, and just place it on your head. Let's see it. Oh, excellent. We are tracking this morning. Okay, so you got that. Students of the month. All right, second, verses 11 through 12. Living as foreign exchange students. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In the whole book of 1 Peter, these verses right here are crucial. They're pivotal. Why? Because it gets down to the very fabric 
of what we're called to do on this earth as Christ followers. Here's what it is. We should live lives that bring glory to God, no matter our circumstances. We should live lives to bring glory to God, no matter our circumstances. From the kindergartner to the adult in the room, we can live that out as part of our mission that God has for us. And up through this time, Peter is kind of talking to his audience about how we interact with people inside the church, our relationship with one another, with believers. But now he makes this huge next step and says, now I want to talk to you, believers, about how you interact with people outside these church walls. And I think that can be a really good thing for us this morning. So we're going to turn there next. Basically, we ask the question, how does our faith go to school? We see a few parts here in this verse. Number one, it says we're foreigners and exiles. This world is not our home. We are just guests passing through it. And I really like this idea of thinking about a foreign exchange student. And we have one attending our church, all right? Mia is going to be going to AGWSR. She is living with Barb and Terry. And I hope you guys get to meet Mia. She's a great girl and uh, this school year. But what's it like to be a foreign exchange student? Well, you get to live with an American family, okay? You get to eat all the good, unhealthy American food. She had a s'more for the first time at a youth thing last week, which is pretty cool. Uh, you get to stay in a home, you get to go to a school that you haven't been to before, and maybe even, best case, you get to meet some friends and build some friendships throughout the school year. But what's different about a foreign exchange student? This is not their home. They're just passing through. Hi, Mia, I see you now. <laughs> She's not embarrassed at all, all right? But you're just passing through. And in a year, it'll be sad, but she goes back to her home in Germany. And that's what we're called as Christ followers. We're just passing through. And uh, sometimes I talk to people throughout the week and they get so frustrated with their coworkers or their classmates or whatever, and they said, oh, that person's just awful. They're kind of evil. They do bad things at work, whatever it is. And it's just a reminder today that the world does not hold the same biblical values that we hold. Right? We are the visitors. We're the guests. And so... When you're frustrated with language they use or they're trying to get away in an unethical you know, process or whatever it is, try to get ahead, um, that's the world's way of doing things. But we're called to be different. Next week, Pastor John's going to look at the importance of God's word in our lives. But the reality is, those outside the church walls, they don't have God's word yet. Yet. And just kind of a thought I had is if you ever get to a spot in this world, whether it's your work, your school, a community committee that you serve on, where it feels super comfortable, maybe that's a red flag for you as a believer. Number two, we're called to abstain from our sinful desires. Um, some of you heard maybe that I was a middle school girls track coach for the first time last year. I survived, thank you very much. And I uh, had a blast doing it because it was a great group of girls. But um, I was kind of new to track, so I didn't, like, didn't want to be the hardcore guy where I set up all the nutrition and diet stuff, so I kind of stayed away from that. But I told the girls that they had to abstain from one thing. You know what it was? Energy drinks. No energy drinks during track season. And so in the context of this verse, abstain means, abstain means no energy drinks. Stay clear. And here it's our sinful desires. Peter says that there's a war going on for our spirit, the part of us that relates to God. And each of us has sinful desires that we struggle with. And so I was thinking of our students today kindergarten through third grade. Raise your hand if you're kindergarten through third grade. Let's see those hands. Excellent. So, well, could they struggle with sin? Well, what about this? You have temptations that are going to pull you away from God, like disobeying your parents when they tell you to do something or being unkind to someone at school. Those are some desires that you might have within you. Fourth through eighth grade, Raise your hands. Four is our fourth through eighth graders. Excellent. What about you? 
Well, you have the temptation to talk bad about people when they're not around. They're not in your circle. So you follow your friend group to talk about a teacher or the administrator or that awful superintendent at the school. Why are you guys laughing at that? Where's our high school students? Raise those hands, high school students. Yes, I see you. I didn't make you guys bring backpacks because I knew you guys were going to be too cool for school. So you get to participate in the blessing at the end, but it's okay. So high school students, let's be honest, there's lots of cheating happening in high schools. So are you going to do your thing just like the rest of your friends or classmates? Are you going to chart a path where you say, I'm going to follow Jesus and trust him for my studies and my homework? As I was track coach last year, I kind of walked by different practices, teams that were working out and stuff, and I got to hear some really colorful language, right? You might hear the same in Main Street on Sunday morning, but, but yeah, you hear that, and it's like, well, do you talk the same way there as you do around your family or, you know, around church on Sunday mornings? Just a question. Adults. How about we just lump all those together and say they could be lumped into sinful desires, right? We can struggle with all those things as adults. Number three, so if we're called as God's chosen people to avoid, abstain from sinful desires, why? What's the purpose? Well, here's the purpose. So that unbelievers will observe our godly lives and glorify God by coming to faith in Jesus. All right? Now, did you grasp that? Why do we do this? Why do we want to go after avoiding these temptations that Satan will put in our way? Our own fleshly desires will get in the way. Why? So that unbelievers, those outside the church wall, will observe our godly lives and glorify God by becoming followers of Jesus. And a question for you this morning What sets you apart from the rest of your classmates? From the rest of your coworkers? From the rest of your teammates? They don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And so, can you distinguish anything from your life that might look different than a non believer? And it's kind of convicting, really, when you think about it. Do they see anything different in me? It was interesting, I was just having a conversation after the first service with a person that works at UNI, and she said, that was interesting. I always try to kind of live out my faith just in a quiet way and do my job really hard, but I've never expressed my faith to my supervisor or anyone else. But just a couple weeks ago, he says, well, I know you're a person of faith and had a question for her. Isn't that crazy? People are watching but do they see anything different the way we do business, the way we interact with employees or coworkers to classmates than anyone else? It reminds me of a, a guy I worked with. Um, he was a student, we'll call him Jay, and it was when I was in Sioux Falls working at a church. And Jay, in a 2,000 plus person high school, all right, was probably, the, as a junior, the best football athlete the school had. And I got to meet Jay because he attended the youth group that I volunteered in in college. And uh, Jay was one of those guys that he wanted to live out his faith, a new believer. And so it didn't matter if you were a science nerd, if you were a goth, if you were a volleyball player, he would just reach out to you, be friendly to you, say hi to you in the hallway. And then he would kind of follow it up with always inviting them to youth group. And so we had all kinds of students that would come to youth group based on that. Well, Jordan got some bad news one day. Why? because there was a new baseball coach. And the new baseball coach implemented practice on youth group night. And so he kind of felt this struggle inside. And so him and a couple buddies, remember this idea of community going together? They said, hey, they talked to their youth pastor, and they said, hey, we're going to go talk to coach. And coach wouldn't budge. And so a few days later, they talked, they prayed about it, and they said, we're just going to turn in our jerseys. Baseball season. So the three of them went together, and they didn't do it like in a rebellious or rude way, like, oh, here. They just did it in kindness and said, hey, we kind of have some conflicting priorities here. We're committed to this already. And uh, they went together as a group of friends, as believers, and they told the coach that. And shockingly, practice got changed for the following week. (laughs) And they stayed on the team. 
And see, there's a, it's a balance. It's not all against sports or for sports. Um, I talked to some youth pastors, and youth pastors can complain just like anyone else. And of course, like there's schedules and conflicts, and you can't go because of this travel season and that travel season. I know it's tough as families. And one youth pastor said, well, I've kind of taken a different approach. They knew a couple families were going to be gone for um, traveling baseball for six weeks. So they're going to miss six weeks in a row of church. And so the youth pastor in the church brought them up right here and commissioned them as missionaries for their travel sports team and said, hey, parents, you're not going to act like everyone else on the sidelines. You're going to pray for, you know, offer to pray for before the games. And they said, okay, hey, student, you're here. You're going to miss six weeks. You're going to be a missionary by offering a Bible study on Saturday afternoons before you have your game. And so see how the different approach, like Jordan made it work out, all right, by going to his coach and saying, hey, we're going to take a stand. And this church kind of made a thing and said, hey, if you do it right, you can be a missionary where you're at. And that's kind of our hope. We kind of find ourselves in the middle of that today. But I love this idea of people watching so unbelievers can become followers of Jesus. Matthew 5, 16 is a verse that some of you guys have probably heard. It comes, we get our name Radiate Youth Ministries from it, but it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Students that are here from the youngest to the oldest, you guys can be a light on your campus this school year. And one thing the adults will tell you, and I've, I tell the students this every year, Right now in your setting, in these school years, you will have the most connections that you ever will have in the rest of your life. The most connections to make a difference on your campus, to be a light to those around you, all right? Adults who get coworkers or maybe a few friends, but right now is the sweet spot for students to share your faith and live out your faith among your teachers, in your classrooms, among your coaches, everyone. The next thing on your bulletin, if you're keeping notes, is practicing the S word. Uh Uh-oh. Submit. All right, I forgot to tell you guys, the foreign exchange students. So I need all the students to stand up real quick, kindergarten through college. Come on, everyone stand up, all right? Here's your action for living as foreigners, all right? You're kind of like doing this. You're just lost. So do a circle, like, where am I at, all right? Come on, everyone do it. Excellent. All right, excellent. Now, it's just stay standing because the next one, submit, is very simple, all right? It means to turn yourself over to someone, so we just kneel, all right? That's an act of submission. So if you can sneak down as a reminder, just kneel, all right, that's good. So that's the idea of submission. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. To order oneself under. And kids, you guys can think of it like this. If you've ever played one of your favorite games, Uno, Sorry, that awful game, Skipbo, all right? You guys like that game, all right? Um, But there's rules to the game, all right? And to submit means, hey, I'm going to play by the rules for the sake of this game and for the sake of the other players. That's what the idea of submission is here. In society, in culture, you choose to play by the rules, Now, of course, our first allegiance as believers is to Jesus Christ, all right? That is our first allegiance as a student and as an adult. And so, but if the government, our schools, if they're not trying to make us abandon our faith in Jesus, then what are we called to do? We're called to submit. And let's be honest, adults, this is hard. It's political season. There's ads, there's commercials, all right? What does it mean to submit to our governing authorities. Students, it's hard listening to a coach or a teacher that gets on your nerves. What does it mean for you to submit in your life? Can you submit to teachers, to paras, to administration? And what does that even look like, young students? Obeying in the classroom? Doing assignments like you're told? not talking bad about a teacher behind their back. And I think through the power of God, you guys can model submission. And students, I'll just say this as an adult, to all the students, we kind of stink at this. 
we as adults, for the most part, kind of stink at submission because we talk. What about this person? What about that person? And um, if the lack of submission shows up in our kids, maybe it's random, but maybe they're seeing it in us and they're seeing it in our culture. Lots of studies have been done. And one of the things that's true of, of this generation of students is they distrust authority. And uh, it's something to wrestle with. So just students know that that's in you. That's what the research says. And so you have to go to scripture to say, how do I live this out in my own life? So what's the end goal here? Well, you study, you take a test, and you always want to get a C on that paper, right? <laughs> no, you want to get the A. Like the paper comes back and you worked hard or maybe you didn't have to work hard, but the teacher gives you an A on that assignment. It feels good, right? All right, some of you are like, actually, Bryce, the C's kind of feel good. <laughs> but whatever you're at, all right? But yeah, it feels good. And here's what student success looks like, all right? Here's what it is in verse 15, and here's your action item. One last action item for you guys, ready? All right, student success, hands up right here. Your kind of fingers are making stars. It's like you get that star on your paper, all right? Very nice. You guys are very kind to do those actions, by the way. <laughs> verse 15 says, for it's God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. And people will talk. If you're trying to live out your faith in this school or your job, people will talk. And students, you have to be ready for it. It's not all sugar, all right? If they get a hold of like you have something wrong and you're like kind of like inviting people to the early morning Bible study or you're leading a prayer time, they are going to look for ways where you're going to mess up and they will dig in. And if you're not like a, a loud person, you're kind of shy and they know you have faith in middle school, they will, they will try to become your enemy if they're really hostile. That's the world that we sometimes go into as students. Students can be brutal sometimes, but stick to your faith. And then I have to wrap up with verse 17 as a bonus. It says this, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And so, students, we said the big idea is to bring God glory in all that you do. So you got those backpacks. We're going to pray over here in a second. But I kind of gave you five things here for the word glory, a little acronym. So I think most of you guys have a bulletin. So if you can write these down quickly... All right, I would love for you to put this somewhere that as you start school these next few weeks, you can be reminded of it, okay? So how do you bring God glory in your school? All right, here's the first one. Give all at your homework and studies. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Yes, even in your homework and your tests, you can bring God glory. Crazy, right? But you can L, lead the way by honoring and respecting my teachers and administrators. I think we already covered that one. O, offer encouragement to those around you. Offer encouragement to those around you. One of the cool things in middle school and high school every week is we have students that come that aren't from our church, that aren't believers. And we have students that come every week in our middle school and high school that are under-resourced. Like they don't have much in their lunch account balance. They're not getting new school shoes. And sometimes those students will not receive any encouragement because they've already been written off by teachers or coaches maybe, even by parents. And so what would it look like for a student to bring encouragement to another student that might need it? R, risk your reputation for a gospel conversation. Ooh, I'm thinking about middle school and high school. This is a big ask. Risk your reputation for a gospel conversation. Barna has done a lot of studies over the years. In the last couple of years, they found out that if you have at least one spiritual conversation within the year, 85% of believers, student believers, felt more confident in their own faith as a result. And 65% say they become more eager to have another gospel conversation. So what I'm saying is, just start with one. Target a friend, target a classmate, 
and just have a gospel conversation. One of the apps, yeah, I know you guys like apps, but the gospel in six words. You can search it on the app store. I give you permission to get your phone out right now. Gospel in six words. It's a way that you can use your phone in this app to walk you through to have a, how to have a gospel conversation with someone. And then the last for glory is why you choose to be a good friend. And just being honest, I couldn't think of a why word, so you choose to be a good friend. That sums up glory, all right? Why? Because people in your class and on your sports teams, they are lacking friendships. And I don't care if you're in second grade or a junior in high school, people need friends. And we always use it as a kind of a worn out cliche, someone eating alone at lunch. But in middle school and high school, I've been through the lunchroom a couple times in the last couple years. That's literally a thing. People with maybe one person, maybe two people eating at a table by themselves. And so what does it look like for you to be a friend, to get outside your bubble and befriend someone that could really use it? I'm going to ask the students to come forward at this time. And you're supposed to bring your backpacks. And so I need anyone from preschool through high school to come on to the front, and you're just going to kind of face the audience. We want to commission you today as missionaries in your school. So come on up, everyone. Let's go. Young ones, all the way up to middle school. It doesn't matter if you don't have your backpack. I love it. And we want to say a prayer for you guys. Amazing. I had my little pony backpack all ready to go today, but I forgot it at home. So, wow, church. So in the first service, we actually had a really good crew of students in the first service. And now in this service, you guys are filling up the stage, which is powerful because everyone looking at me right here, we want to say, as you guys go to school this year, you get to be missionaries. And what does that mean? You get to be kind. You get to, you get to have, um, be a friend to someone middle school and high school students, you guys get to have gospel conversations. You guys get to invite them things like Awana in church, and that's pretty amazing. And so at the end of of the prayer here today, there is some little backpack keychains for you guys. And in our last song, you guys can just kind of peruse the front, and you pick one of the keychains to put on your backpack, if you'd be willing, to kind of be a reminder that God goes with you. And we have a picture up there on the screen for the adults to see all the different ones. But maybe something that even could play a small part of like, really a little fish? Would someone in your class maybe ask you about it? Maybe. But it's a reminder to you. And so before I pray for you guys, there's just, I'm going to say a statement, and you guys are going to say the words, Jesus is with me. All right? So let's try that, try that together. Blah, 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 blah. Jesus is with me. All right, you guys ready? This is going to be a prayer, so let's close our eyes. Students, you're going to say that after I kind of declare this as a commission for you guys to go to school. When it's the night before going to school, I'm picking out my clothes and making sure I have all my school supplies. Jesus is with me. All right. Okay. When I'm waking up and eating my breakfast, Jesus is with me. Are the high schoolers doing this? I feel that we need some energy. Oh, man, okay, okay. They're spying on you guys. When I'm getting on the bus or driving to school each morning, Jesus is with me. When I meet my teachers and new friends in my class, Jesus is with me. When I feel like I don't have many or any friends this school year, Jesus is with me. When I'm eating at my lunch table, Jesus is with me. When I feel like I can't figure out my homework or might fail a test, Jesus is with me. When I'm frustrated with my parents or my teachers, Jesus is with me. When I'm playing sports, acting in the play, or playing my instrument, Jesus is with me. When I interact with my family after school is over, and when I go to bed at night, Jesus is with me. Just want to have all of us stand. We just want to pray over these students. And I know we have teachers and bus drivers and administrators in this church. And we just want to say um, we're praying for you this year 
And as someone told me last week, it, doesn't, it can't just end with one prayer time before school starts, but we can lift up these students and our staff. So let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for the gift of these students from preschool through college that are represented here in this sanctuary. God, we are grateful just for the chance to pour into them and for our families that are here to pour into them. God, we just thank you. And we look um, to the, the year ahead, God. It's an eager excitement of what you're going to do. And God, right now, we just commission each of these students as missionaries in their homes, in their school, in their sports teams, God, that they might enact and talk differently than everyone else, God, that they might follow you in all that they do. God, we give this school year to you and um, each of them, God, give them energy for the school year. God, give them close friendships that are good for them. God, give them success in their studies. And God, we pray over the staff of our schools. We, think of, we pray over homeschool families that are going to be starting up again. We, we pray over coaches and bus drivers and teachers and paras, administrators, lunch ladies, God, that this would be a great year for them. God, help each of them navigate their own faith in their work environment. God, give them boldness and courage just to stand up for those that are under-resourced, those that are having a tough go. Give them compassion on those that are struggling in classes. God, we thank you for each of our school staff. We thank you for these students, God. Just pray a blessing over this school year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.